Good morning. morning. How is everyone? Good. Um, Maybe I'm counterculture, but I'm glad to be back outside, to be honest with you. Um, It's kind of nice. For those of you that don't know, my name is Justin. I'm uh, on staff here and teach and do uh, some other things as well. But let me just start by opening and we'll pray and continue to get our hearts where Bailey's and Ben's already taken them pretty powerfully. So God, we're just asking right now that you be in the middle of this tent, that this would be a gathering that's centralized and focused on you as its epicenter. You're the middle of this gathering, God. And no more can be the days where we gather um, in vain pursuit, but we come knowing that we're going to encounter the living God. And so, God, would you awaken that expectation in all of us right now? And those aren't just cool churchy words that I'm saying. God, I'm asking you to do that to me and to us by the power of your spirit, um, which is even more powerful than our own will. So we're asking for you to come, for you to take over, for you to speak, and you do the ministry today as you've already been doing. We just want you. We sang that. So help us posture in that now, in Christ's name. Amen? Amen. Oh, I'm going to come out of the gate pretty heavy. You guys good with that? Okay, cool. Because even if you said no, I was probably still going to come out of the gate pretty heavy. It just would have failed a little bit more. Listen to these uh, few statements that will maybe frame the work today. Without a revival of the word of God amongst us, without tethering our lives to the word, all of our attempts for spiritual restoration in our lives will remain impossible. Without a revival of the word of God amongst us, without us tethering our lives to the word, all of our attempts for spiritual restoration will be impossible. Second, the work of God and God's word are inseparable. They always go together. And in reality, a spiritual community has to be anchored in and moved by the spiritual word of God. Something that never leaves us hungry. Something that always sustains us. You know, those three statements after studying were my three personal takeaways from my own life that I write down in my journal because I need to remember things. So I put in front of me as I read and as I study those things, just accepting that these are my daily bread for the next little season of my life. Be it two days, two weeks, two months, I don't know. But this has also been the story in the book of Ezra, which is where we're at right now, is that God's word and God's work are not separate from one another. And if you were to ask me, what is the one thing that has threatened to take down the church throughout history? It's hypocrisy. It's the work of God void of the word of God and the word of God void of stepping out into the work of God, right? It's when those two things become separated from one another that the church has lost its way. They either become a huddle that knows so much about God's word but does nothing with it, or they become a people that go and do a bunch of things that they think God wants to do without consulting the word of God. And the book of Ezra is so powerful because it constantly puts this in front of us. The people could not move because they were in exile. But God sent his word through prophets. God sent his word through priests, through leaders. God stirred up the hearts of leaders with his word. And that word is what gave birth to a new movement. It wasn't separate than that. It wasn't looking up on Instagram and finding the cool place where God seems to be moving and getting there. It was the word of God in the hearts of men and women that changed the people of God. That was the movement of God. And we've seen this in in the book of Ezra. And for those of you that don't know, we're in the book of Ezra. And 
we called the series Parallels because the question, the curiosity I had looking at the book of Ezra is like, man, they didn't have a property. They didn't have a home. They were between spaces. We don't have a property, theoretically. Our home is down the street on Santa Fe because this is almost all the way sold and that's already purchased down there. And the question was, what can we glean in our journey from here to there from a story about people who went from here to there based on God's word too? That's the question. And I want to stay there. My mind wants to get wrapped in the details. Well, technically, when are we and what are we and what is it? I'm like, uh-uh. God has a story and a plan he's playing out in the book of Ezra. God has a story and a plan that he's playing out amongst the people of Newcom and in our city, right? And that's what we all get to be a part of, including me. And you look at the six chapters in the book of Ezra leading up into chapter 7, and you see that the people were in exile, and they were brought back from exile. The temple foundation was built, and then the places of sacrifice and worship were established, and then the temple walls get finished, and now they have their space to start back up the rhythms of their worship of God. Right? Now, some of us may have felt those when we went back in the room for a few weeks, like, oh, I can worship again. It's like, cool, well, You could have worshipped at home too. You can worship here. You can worship in there. We can worship here. We can worship on Tuesday morning on a prayer walk down the street with the six or seven of us that are involved in that so far. Worship is all places because the living God, the spirit of the living God lives in us. Everywhere I go is a temple. Everywhere. For good and for not, right? (laughs) Hopefully I'm tending well to what I am, says God. Temple of spirit. The temple was dedicated in chapter 6, and and we get to this place where the book kind of lands in chapter 6, and it's the completion of what we would call wave 1 of God's activity, bringing his people home from exile and rebuilding their places of worship. And after chapter 6, 57 years pass before the beginning of chapter 7. I don't know about you, but We're probably talking a whole lifetime for some people in that day and age. 57 years pass. In that time, the entire book of Esther was written, which comes after Nehemiah. The entire book was written. In that time, God showed favor behind the scenes, but he was about to bring his favor back into the forefront of everyone's vision and everyone's understanding. And the beginning of chapter Seven is the beginning of wave number two of God's activity. The first wave was to bring about the people from Babylon, from exile, into rebuilding their temple in Jerusalem. And the second wave is all about God's activity in bringing about spiritual reform. Right? What good are buildings without people practicing the living word of God? What good is property? If it's not just seen as a resource for the living God to use to make his name great and be glorified in those places. So chapter 7 is the beginning of wave 2, God's activity, bringing about spiritual reform, bringing more of his people home from exile. This is a generational work, right? These are people who were probably born in Babylon that had never been to Jerusalem, but maybe have heard faint whispers about the glory of the temple, but they'd never been there. It's like 900 miles worth of walking from Babylon all the way to Jerusalem. It's not something you just like, oh, I'm going to take my kid to Universal Studios this weekend. It's just a couple hour drive, right? We're talking by foot, at risk. No one had taken the journey. But wave two includes this return of more people from exile to bring about a spiritual, a social renewal, reform, and a revival amongst the people. And today we get to look at chapter seven and and we'll unpack some of the beginnings of this. See, chapter seven was needed. The book could have stopped at chapter six. They had their place of worship. 
But God looked upon that house of worship and looked upon the place of Jerusalem and saw that there was something missing in the daily lives, in the practicing lives, in the understanding. Now we use this passage, I'll use it as an illustration. This isn't perfect context, but when God says, I think it's through Hosea, my people perish for lack of knowledge. They didn't have access to the word of God in the way that God was about to make it accessible. So remember that word. It causes revival. It causes reform. The word of God and the work of God are the same thing. In the beginning, God said, and what happened? The work of creation happens through the word of God. The work of renewal and revival happens through the word of God. And so the temple was complete. The house for the dwelling place of God and worship and festivals and sacrificial systems was all set up. And for 57 years, it was being used. But something was missing. Something was needed. There was more. There was deeper. There was wider things from God that needed to take place. And it was time here, 57 years into practicing in the temple, that a new generation of exiles would come home to Jerusalem and mix with those who had already returned just a generation before. I don't know about you. I get excited when I think about the term like generation. And I would like to think of us as a new generation, a new iteration, a new expression, a new wine of what God wants to do in our community, in our church, in our gatherings, in our personal lives. I would like to see myself as a new generation, but at the end of the day, I'm like halfway done living based on statistic, statistics. See, I can't even talk. I'm too old now. And the reality is we have to do the work of being the new generation of God and ushering in the new generation of God. And many times God postures us for these things. Do you hear it? Do you see it? Do you know it? Have you asked God about that? God could see the hearts of his people. They rebuilt and reformed their temple, but something was missing. And that thing that was missing was the inner working of the heart of the people had not yet been rebuilt, reformed, or revived. Because it was a community that was absent of the ongoing teachings of God's word. I mean, have you seen places of worship? I've been a part of them. I've led some of them. I led some of them for many years. Where, man, the worship was incredible. The flame burned out the moment the building was empty. The worship was incredible. People got in their cars and the flame burned out by the time we got home. I experienced it too. I was like, could we have something so good that it makes me not want to pursue God in the other ways, the other six days of the week. Could the rock and roll be so awesome or the depth of our worship times be so awesome that it's more like kind of glory? <laughs> That's an original. You're welcome. That was totally off the cuff. I apologize. It's not in my notes. You can't prove it. I'll deny it. I'll delete the video. I'll keep it in the video. <laughs> the word of God is what sustains us. Honestly, fully, truly. It's always been that way. It's the instrument through which all things we see were made and everything we don't see wasn't made. Everything that God did happened through his word. The heart of the people hadn't been rebuilt, reformed, or revived because there was no word See, the temple was all part of a greater purpose that God had for his people, rebuilding their lives. It was a connection point between God and the people so they could build their lives upon him as a spiritual people. But they needed to know how to live spiritually, how to have spiritual lives, and how to operate as God's people, constantly making God their God and operating as people of God. That's actually the hardest thing to do. It's easy to come and sing. It's harder to leave and live, right? Very difficult. Israel, in an incredible way, needed, in a profound way, 57 years of walking with just whisperings and murmurings of the law. I mean, have you ever played the game Telephone, where you start at one side and you say it in someone's ear, and then they say it in someone's ear, and by the time you get to the end, the story's changed? Oral tradition sometimes fizzles out like that. And a powerful preacher was needed. Somebody was needed to come. Israel needed a guide and a helper. They needed an inbreaking voice in the flesh to help guide them 
inwardly as spiritual people and to align their hearts with God's heart for them. Hmm. Kind of interesting, right? I mean, isn't that what Jesus was for us? And here's God filling someone with his word. Jesus was the word, but he's filling someone with the word to come and be that for people that needed to know because they were perishing for their lack of understanding. Their spiritual lives were flat, routine. God in his great provision sends an instrument, this guide, this helper. I mean, if you think about your own life, I know me, like my story is a chapter book filled cover to cover with people that came to be my guide and my helper. I would not know Jesus if it wasn't for guide after guide after guide, helper after helper after helper. People that sacrificed their future to build into my future. People that shared with me out of their intimacy with God, out of their time spent with God. People who understood that they were a resource in the hand of God to reach who was next. I got to be next so many times for so many people. I got to be the one that they poured into. First question is, as you survey your life, who are those people? But second would be, are you a helper? Are you a guide for others? Or is your faith just for your own personal experience? Because the other side of personal experience is sharing personal experience because you need to be flesh and blood what it looks like to live out the law of the Lord to other people. Person to person. It's huge. God fills someone with this. We'll read Ezra chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. Now after this, which is after those 57 years, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra the son of Sariah, son of Azariah, son of Hilkiah, son of Shalom, son of Zadok, son of Ahitub, son of Amariah, son of Azariah, son of Marioth, son of Zariah, son of Uzi, son of Buki, you're welcome, son of Abishu, son of uh, Phinehas, and son of Eleazar who was son of Aaron, the chief priest. This Ezra went up from Babylonia. He was a scribe skilled in the what? The law of Moses, the law of the Lord, the God of Israel. The king granted him all that he asked, for the hand of the Lord his God was upon him. Sixty years after the temple was rebuilt and its rhythms were kicked back into function and the family of God was assimilating more and more, God sends a man named Ezra. Here's what's crazy. Ezra probably wrote this book and then it was compiled by the kings of Persia in its own way. Ezra was probably born between chapter 6 and chapter 7. So he had studied not only the law of the Lord, but the history of God's movement. How cool is that? The generational work of God continued through Ezra. And you look at this story. Those who had carried them through the journey up until chapter 6, they're gone. This new generation was going to rise up. These people needed this new leader named Ezra to carry on the work of God. And if you listen to those lists, that list of names, and if you do your homework and you go back, there's a few names that are missing from the story. But if you listen to those names and you go back through scripture, you realize that this is a list of all the most high profile high priests and priests that took place in the story of Israel's journey since the time of Moses. Generations of God's plan and movement happened through these guys. And it lands in this name, Aaron. Who Aaron, do you guys know who Aaron was? 
Aaron was the brother of Moses. When Moses was called by God through a burning bush, Moses said to God, like, I, I, I don't know how to talk. I can't go carry this to the Egyptians. There's no way. I can't go tell them to set our people free. And then God rebukes him and says, who gave you a mouth anyways? Literally, that's like what it says. And then he says, I'll send with you your brother. What? Aaron. So what was Aaron's job? It was to carry the word of God to the people that needed to hear the word of God so that the word of God could cause the movement of God to take place in places of exile. So let's rewind. Who does this lineage land with? How powerful is this? This connects Ezra to the time that the law and the word of God was given all the way back to the people of Israel at a burning bush moment and to a moment when stone tablets were filled with the commands of God at, at Mount Horeb. Aaron and Moses carried the responsibility of the law of the word of God. And the idea here is that Ezra was being sent and called by God to bring, bring revival to the people of God and reform to the people of God the same exact way that Moses and Aaron did. The lineage is important because it traces the work of Ezra to the people of back in the exile, the original exiled people, the original Hebrews being imprisoned and stuck in captivity. And for that reason, many people refer to Ezra as the second Moses. Hmm. You know, Ezra's job was going to be to call people back to the word of God and to walking in his ways. And he was going to have revival take place through him in God's word and God's way, God's work, all of those things. And I started thinking about revival this week. And I realized that I have a tendency and did, especially early on in my faith, to suffer from this law of attraction where it was like, wherever God's moving, I mentioned it earlier, I got to get there. And there is validity to that. God uses people groups and I want to glean and learn from what he's doing in other people. I tended to look outside of myself to where God is moving so I can get there and I can join in. And I felt when I looked back over my own life that I had been chasing cool movements of God since I was a young believer. And it's fizzled out over the years because I realize everyone just gets their turn. Even if you look at worship movements in the church, we used to call them this band and now it's this band and now it's this part of the world or it's that part of the world. Same God fresh expressions popping up all over the place. And it was good, but it was also unsatisfying because I realized looking back over my own life and my own testimony that all along, all I really wanted was my own personal revival, right? This same type of revival that Ezra was going to bring. Like I've always wanted that for my own self. I mean, secondhand revival is cool. I want firsthand revival. And I want that for Newcom. We're not looking at other places where God's doing things because that's where God is doing things other places. We're looking where God's moving amongst us. And every single one of us matter. If you've disqualified yourself because you're too young, too old, too different, too this, too that, get over it. You're a part of this and God's speaking through you to all of us. Firsthand movements happen where God's moving amongst the people. Not only did I want my own revival, but I also wanted to be around others that want the same thing. And I see that stirring amongst us. I feel that stirring amongst us. But even that word revival had us looking for something somewhere where God was doing this great thing that we could all add to our church so we could become like them or like those other movements. And all along, God's revival had always been waiting for me right where my own two, two feet stood. God's chosen method for revival is to instigate revival through his word, which I have right here, right now. All that needed to change is my heart posture towards it, right? True revival is more about intimately returning to God than it is about going anywhere, right? Right? It's about allowing God's word to take possession of my heart. And this is the opportunity God's giving Israel through Ezra, isn't it? True revival is more about intimacy than cool initiatives. 
So my question is, what are you adding to your life to help stir up the fires of revival that have more to do with things outside of you than things inside of you? Because God wants to start with you and make the you an us, and then the us can go do what God wants us to do. But really, it's God taking us there anyway. A people truly returning to God's word and earnestly rebuilding their lives on him and him alone are people who are being recipients of revival. So for us, imagine a community that was truly, wholly returning to God. And that's what we saw our gathering in our community as. Oh, I'm part of a group of people that is constantly returning my heart back to God, giving him full possession of everything that I am and looking for where God wants to do his work and his way in me, period. Everything else follows that. This was the work God called Ezra to. The text says after this lineage that connects Ezra back to Aaron as someone that's going to share the word of God with people. It says, This Ezra went up from Babylonia. He was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses that the Lord God of Israel had given. And the king granted him all that he asked for, for the hand of the Lord was upon him. You know what the word Ezra means? It means the Lord has helped or helper. I'm like, I love, I love the languages. Because every single person is an alliteration. Every single one of them. It's pretty powerful. Ezra was a scribe, as the scripture says here. But the words for scribe means that he was a skilled teacher in the law of Moses. He was in Babylon. And while he was in Babylon, he had been teaching in Babylon and leading a local spiritual community of Israelites and doing it in such a way that had won the favor of the king. And so what he's called to do now in Jerusalem is the same thing he was doing in Babylon. So for those of us with that massive excuse that, well, one day when we get there, I'll start worshiping and I'll start doing the thing that God wants me to do. Once this, once this, once this, once this. That's not a reality for us as the people of God. You only have here and now. That's life. So wherever your two feet are are where the revival of God's word needs to take place, period. Ezra was doing it in Babylon. In Babylon. The greatest kingdom the world had ever seen up until that moment. Ezra was doing this, leading the local spiritual community, organizing them according to God's word. When we get there, we can do this. When we're at 802, which is the address down the street, we can do that. Maybe. All I know is I got today. This way that Ezra lived won the favor of the king. So much so that Ezra had been grafted into the king's, like, leadership. And he was a secretary working under the king. How cool is that? And God gave him a place in political authority of sorts. And so Ezra has access to the king, and the king has favor on Ezra. So Ezra comes to the king and asks the king to let the people go back to Israel again. Back to Jerusalem, sorry, again. And the king, because he had favor on him and they had relationship of sorts, granted him, the scripture says, all that he asked. It's a detailed request, and we'll hit some of it in bullet points in a minute. And this all happened not because the king was benevolent, not because Ezra had a great relationship with him, but it attributes it in the scriptures to this happens because the hand of the Lord was upon him. Guys, I want that to be said about our community. I want it to be said about me, my sons, my wife, my family, your family, that the hand of the Lord was upon us as we moved, as we did the things of God. Six different times you read that in Ezra 6, 7, and 8, that the hand of the Lord was upon him. It's a theme in the life of Jesus, too. And you may not see it as clearly, but I'll point it out quickly as we continue through the text. In John 8, 29, Jesus is talking about his relationship with the Father. And he says this, And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. Why? For I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Ezra, in always seeking to do the things of God, found himself naturally in the favor 
of God, right? He didn't have to play this game that we often play, like, well, if I do this, then God's going to bless me, and if I don't, God won't. We don't cause the blessing of God. Blessing isn't ours to give. I can bless you in and of myself and with good intent, and that's a beautiful thing to do. But God is the one that authenticates, legitimizes, and gives blessing, ultimately. Ezra was walking in blessing through obedience. The way of his life was just filled with it because that's the pathway of those who walk not in the counsel of the wicked, stand not in the way of sinners, and sit not in the seat of scoffers. On his word they dwell day and night, and he leads them by streams of living water, and all that he does, he prospers, Psalm 1. That's Ezra, isn't it? Gosh, I want to be an Ezra. The more and more I read, I had to come in and tell my wife a few times this week, like, I have to stop reading. It's going to be irrelevant information, like, because I was just learning more about Ezra. Go home. Dig in. Get lost. He's a hero of the faith. Hero. Even in Judaism, he is a hero. He walked in the ways of the Lord. And we get a big picture of more of the heart of Ezra in verse 10 here. But I'll read up until that moment. Verse 7. And there went up also to Jerusalem, so the people that went with, Israel, with uh, Ezra, in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. Some of the people of Israel went with them, some of the priests and Levites and singers went with them, and gatekeepers. For those of you that are in business, gatekeepers can drive you crazy. These are good gatekeepers. Um, these are people that, you know, watch over the temple. And the temple servant also went with them. So a spiritual co cohort gets on board with the movement, and they all come back. And he came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which is in the seventh year of the king. And it's important because in verse 9, on the first day of the first month, he began to go up from Babylon. And it took him until the, the first day of the fifth month to come to Jerusalem. It took a long time to walk that 900 or so miles. But Ezra is seeking to be someone that followed the law of the Lord with his heart not just for duty's sake, but with his heart, decided to take his journey at the beginning of Passover 1 and 2 at the beginning of the Jewish calendar. So it was like Jewish New Year for them back then. This was the first day of the, of the new year. He is following to a T to set up a model for those as a guide and as a helper for people to understand. You order your life around the word and the festivals and the things of God. I love it, even in his behavior. And we'll see that in just a second here. Verse 10, for Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. If you look at the Hebrew language, it paints a wider picture than some of these words paint. And it was fun studying this. The language here says Ezra set his heart to study the law of the Lord. The term set his heart means that he deliberately positioned his heart or his entire being for the purpose of studying the law of the Lord. Listen, I have a lot of narratives in my life. Some of them have been going on longer than others. Some of them are shorter. Some of them are new, if you understand what I'm saying. It's like, I've got a lot of things that I do. To be referred to someone that sets their heart or their entire being for the purpose of studying, doing, and teaching God's word is something I will always reach for. But I don't think I will ever arrive at that label. Ezra in the scriptures is represented as somebody that has done that first and foremost. And even here by sharing that, Ezra is a helper and a guide for us. This was his master status in culture. He was changing culture with the things of God. Changing it. In fact, he's told to do that amongst all of the people in Israel. And if, as we read on in the story, we'll see even to people outside of Jerusalem as well. He set his heart, his entire being, for the purpose of studying, 
which the word studying mean, meant to seek and inquire of God. So he would read the scriptures and seek God in them and inquire of God what they meant. And your study of scripture should resemble that somewhat. The getting it done before we go to work or after we get home is awesome if it's filled with seeking and filled with inquiry, looking for God in the text. Because whose words are they? God's words. It's a conversation, a dialogue, whether it's through the history in the scripture or through the revelation of Jesus or through the letters written to churches in the New Testament. It's all dialogue with God. You get this picture of Ezra studying, seeking, and inquiring. He said not only that, he set his heart to study the law of the Lord, and it's noteworthy that it's written here. And to do it, this is that breakdown we talked about early on, right? Just the word of God without doing, we can fall off the rails. Just the doing without the word of God, we can fall off the rails. The work of God and the word of God are the same thing. They have to be. We're missing if we're not doing both. Inquiring and seeking, and the word doing there means practice. Inquire and seek and practice the word of God. Teaching in the Hebrew means teaching. It's not that special, sorry. But the order of things is very important here, right? He wasn't one that just taught out of his knowledge. He taught out of his knowledge plus his practice of the word of God. And the most influential people in my life are people who know God's word and practice it. Because I can clearly see God through the practice that they're living in. Newcom will be a place where we build our house upon the rock. We don't just hear and then not do. We hear and do like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. Because those who hear and do not do are like those who what? Build their house on sand. And I don't want to build a movement based on sand. And found it on sand. This is why God's sending Ezra. Do you see it? Do you see it? There's many Ezra's amongst us as well. Sitting in this community. People I sit with at Chipotle or at coffee that talk about how they've learned and they're practicing or fighting to practice and teaching it to others. Welcome to the party. Many of us can be helper and guide. Ezra is postured for God's use. He had no idea. He was doing his thing in Babylon and then God put it on his heart. He goes to the king. The king says, yes, replicate your process in Jerusalem. They could use that. And he's like, okay, this is what my whole life is about. See, helpers are always helping others out of how they've been helped with God. It comes from a place of dependence. It comes from that massive place inside of them where they know they need God. And guides can only take people where they've been led. Because they know the lay of the land. And I'll be honest with you. We were wondering, God, what would you have us do first? In this new era of Newcom. Allie and Derek and I were talking. And Allie said, I don't know. I'm, I'm meeting with Bree, but I have some ideas that Bree and I are going to talk about. And whether it originated with Allie or Bree or, or Brally, just both of you, I'm not sure. But to the ones who had heard from God and been practicing it and been led by God in it, they guided me as often as I've been able to guide them as well back. We need to start walking and praying. Because God had led them there. They had experience and knew that we could be led there as a community. And little by little, we're getting this thing off the ground and moving. 7.15, Tuesday mornings. Join us. Walk and pray from here to 8.02 and back again. Ezra's authority came from his intimacy with God through the word, Right? He was living a lifestyle of ongoing revival. And because of that, God could use Ezra to bring about revival other places. And I'll just say this. Hearing and doing God's word makes us accessible for God's use. 
We're just readily accessible. Look at the favor that landed on Ezra because of his lifestyle of hearing and doing. His testimony of, I think you call it moral authority, where you've lived out what you believe so much that people just see where your authority comes from in Christ. They can see that you've been shaped and formed by God in how you live and how you act. And Ezra 7, 11 through 26 gives us this story, but I'll give us some synopsis statements. Listen to the power that God allowed to rest upon Ezra. Hmm. Verse 13, any of the king's subjects who were of Israelite descent were granted freedom to return to Jerusalem. So exile was abolished. Done. Verse 15 through 20, finances for the expedition from Babylon to Jerusalem for the worship of God's house were to come from the royal treasury. So the kingdom gave its money. Again, this has happened already twice. Verse 19, Ezra was to take with him articles of gold and bronze donated by the king for use in temple worship. So things that were meant for worshiping other gods, he said, take these and dedicate them towards the God of heaven is the words used in, in scripture. Listen to this, verse 24, all of God's servants consecrated to the work of God's house were to be exempt from paying taxes. Like, is this America? But imagine that. Verse 25 and 26, Ezra was given authority. This blows my mind. To appoint magistrates and judges and to enforce legal decisions with penalties of imprisonment, confiscation of goods, and even the death penalty on people in the region. He was given authority. The authority of the king. It's kind of amazing the favor that follows those who make their object of their life, God's word, living it out and teaching others. Listen, you don't have to be a pastor to do it. In fact, being a pastor is maybe one of the last things I think about in my personal spiritual life. Pastor is the gift God gave me to use me for spaces where that's needed. I pastor everywhere that I go. My spiritual life with Jesus is, I'm a son of Jesus, of God. I'm a son of God that came to know God through the son of God. That's Jesus. And I walk with God. I walk with Jesus and I'm led by the Holy Spirit. That's what I seek to allow to consume my life. Does favor follow me like it follows Ezra? No, not yet. But I bet he wasn't keeping score either. What did Jesus say? Seek first and what? All those things get added. Why am I chasing what's added and then calling that revival when revival is me with Jesus and nobody else? I swore I wasn't going to cry, but I'll hold them back. I'll talk through it. I'll be strong. Just the story of God's faithfulness in, in like the personal times with Jesus. You guys know. God breaks through and talks and you're like, oh my gosh, he's with me. Ezra comments at the end and it's, we're going we're gonna to land here. I wanted to just give us a portrait of this person of Ezra. Ezra 7, 27 through 28. After all of this favor, <laughs> the man that the book is named after opens his mouth for the first time first person and his response to all of this, his words are recorded. And he says this about all of it. Blessed be the Lord, the God of our fathers who Ezra was connected to, right? The God of our fathers who put such a thing into the heart of the King. So is he giving the King authority and glory for it? No, he's giving God glory for what took place in putting this in the heart of the king to beautify the house of the Lord that's in Jerusalem and who extended to me his steadfast love before the king and his counselors and before all the king's mighty officers. 
I took courage, for the hand of the Lord my God was on me, and I gathered leading men from the house to go up with me. Ezra is literally given the stamp of approval. If you read this, this letter from verse 11 all the way through verse 26 of chapter 7, it was a copy of, of this edict that was given to Ezra. So when people messed with him, it was his badge. Like, nope, the king told me. Article 4, line 3. These are my bylaws. These give me authority. Ezra doesn't talk about anything other than look at what God's done. Look at where the glory belongs. Blessed be the Lord, the God of our fathers, who put such a thing in the heart of the king to beautify the house of the Lord that's in Jerusalem and extended to me a steadfast love before the king and his counselors and before all the king's mighty officers. I took courage as a response to God's movement. I took courage for the hand of the Lord my God was on me and I gathered leading men from Israel to go up with me. Can you think about the character of those men that he probably gathered? Were they people that just knew the word and sat back and judged people from a distance? Or, they were, or were they people with dirty hands from getting meddled into the affairs of the people that were wrestling, figuring out how to live the way of God? He picked people probably like him to go and establish systems that would represent the Father. I'm like, pick me, Ezra, please. I don't know about like the penalties of imprisonment, confiscation of good, and death penalty. I mean, Ezra can take care of that, but I'll be on the team. So a few questions, and we can discuss for a minute. Are you an Ezra? A helper, a guide? Our community doesn't need more titles. It doesn't need authoritative structure. The community around us needs helpers and guides, which means it takes time and sacrifice, which means it takes person-to-person -person commitment, which means it takes person-to-God connection and intimacy. How could we be called by God to go anywhere without having relationship and communication with him. Are you an Ezra? Where have you been? Who's been one to you? When you think about Ezra for the next three chapters, I want you to think about that as he brings about social reform and revival. Two, have you stumbled into the space that I often stumble into where you believe that revival is somewhere you need to go and something you need to go join to be a part of it more than it is you being intimately connected with the Father? God uses who he has. Does God have you? So we can open it up and we can have uh, some questions. We won't walk around with the mic today because most of our sound setup is still remnant from being inside and it might get squealy and weird. So if you have something to share that God's done in you, yell. I'm going to not use the word speak up anymore because clearly that's the wrong distinction. We need to turn it up to 11, I guess. But let me put a condition on our sharing today. This isn't a time to reteach what we thought was missing or could have been taught. This is a time to testify about what God's told you. About what God's doing in you. And so as you think through those things and if you sense something in the message that's edifying to the rest of us, that's testify-oriented, bring it. 
because that's the greatest times of conversation we've had. And I don't want to be Bible answer man, but I'll have to be if you're really going to push me. But I'd rather hear what God's word's doing in you than something I may or may not know. <laughs> so anything anyone want to share before we close? Mike. Yes. Uh, volume 11. So <laughs> I think something that I really identify with is it's easy for me to, to want like a program or like direction. Like, hey, go do this. Go be part of this. This is the church, quote unquote, is putting this on. But what I'm hearing is what I've been really trying to practice is like stepping out into that scary place of like, hey, I think God's calling me to do this. Go do it. Hmm. And can I tell you, I see you doing that because we walk closer than some others may with you. I know you walk with a lot of people here. Mike's one of our elders and does serve as, as guide to many people, helper to many people. But I see that in you. I see you letting go of initiatives and grabbing movement from the spirit in powerful ways. Thank you for that. Yeah. Mike, would you repeat for us? Yeah. He said he, he agrees. It's, it's scary, but you sometimes have to go with what God, what God calls you to. Right on. Yeah. Anyone else? Eddie. Sure. Sensei. Uh... <laughs> it didn't say sensei anywhere in the scripture, bro. <laughs> that is not an aspiration I have. Only God's word defines my titles. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> But yes. <laughs> uh, just kind of like a testimony for our marriage. Um, we were at the marriage retreat, as you guys know, and some of you got called uh, called us to use us as in our marriage to pray uh, Saturday night for those who needed prayer. And we came unexpectedly. With we didn't. We've never done that together for other couples per se, right? Um, and so we pray for others who really it, it put it in perspective how many people are hurting and are in their marriage right um, to pray for them as a couple really that scripture where we must bear each other's bear, uh, burdens upon ourselves right share each other's burdens it came alive looking over to my wife her crying but just because their burdens are upon us you know and then I have to be the, the, the spiritual husband that's backing her up and supporting her and then at the same time I felt like the need to like wash her with the word of God as the scripture says as well right like all these things are happening just because we're praying for couples you know and to others that seem very like small but it was powerful a, a possible 30 second prayer to some ended up being like a five minute prayer with tears and joy and laughter yeah. and, and it was just a very big spiritual thing that um kind of goes to what you're saying is like we're here to help one another we're here to push one another and we're here to bear each other's burdens and that i just want to testify to that in our marriage that's incredible thanks eddie helper and guide right doesn't ever seek role position title authority just help and guide out of how they've been helped and guided yep clay in god's hands for sure Anybody else? Yeah. Mike? Yeah, we're going to do what the Lord called us to do. Right on. Thanks, Bill. Bill, Mike. <laughs> Anyone else? Maybe one or two more? Yeah. That's awesome. 
Yeah, and we're going to see in the next chapter next week I'll be sharing Ezra's going to need to endure because it's a pretty picture looking at it from 10,000 feet and it's ugly once your feet hit the ground. Endurance is difficult. Yep. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah, those, how we identify with our own selves in God's many, many seasons. It's, uh, we all carry that kind of like false permanence, especially as parents. My oldest is 17, and I don't know what's around the corner in the next few years, correct? Your oldest is older than me. You said it. I'm repeating. Um, so there's there's a lot there, right? And everything is interim in this life, and so being present in the middle of it is so important. And it's encouraging to hear you share the testimony of God's benevolence and kindness to you as you've been taking off one name and putting on a new name over and over. Uh, what a testimony. That's incredible. Awesome. Last one, yeah. Sounds like God's call. We're with you on the journey, and if you would like, happy to surround you with prayer today, if that's something that would help you. Um, we'll, we Please come up right afterwards if you want, and so it's not like a spectacle or anything like that. It's personal, just like the call of God is. And in closing, though it may take us in a different path in the message a little bit, I want to encourage you with a scripture, if you don't mind because this is the beginning of the rest of your life. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 7, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. He comforts us in all our affliction, so we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort we ourselves have been comforted by God with. So what you've gone through and been comforted by God in is for you first, but it's really for us later because now you have the 
receiving from God, you've been guided, you've been helped, and you will continue to need that help from the Father, but that's your wellspring that you'll also give. And what he gave you is for you and for others. Well, we'll surround you and pray some of those things over you when we close. Um, thank you. Next week we'll get into a little bit of where the rubber meets the road with the reformer and the revival. And when those boots hit the ground, it gets interesting. So love you guys. Have a good Sunday. And we'll see you next week. Just want to encourage you as we're stepping in here to worship. Um, lean in to the Lord. You know, he's here. The Spirit moves among us as we gather. So just be open to what the Lord is speaking to you and uh, what the Lord is looking to remove from you. Just be willing to sacrifice and lay down those things that are getting in the way. Um, but just lean in. That's all it takes. Doesn't doesn't take a lot of intentionality to it. Just be open to it, all right?
move forward, I would love it if we could, if you're able, and two, if you stand with us, we're going to continue to worship here. But before we move on, I, I just want us to sing that bridge again. The Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want. And that's really our, our prayer and our truth this morning. We're not here just to do church, to listen to a word, to say hi to our friends. I mean, that's all, that's all fine and dandy. That's good. It's good things. But we're really here to encounter God. We're really here to encounter His Spirit, to pour out our love to Him. We're here to worship Him. So I'd love it if we could sing that bridge one more time. But let's sing it from our hearts this morning. Spirit, come and rest on this place. Come rest on this body. You really are all that we want. Let's sing that again. Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want. You're all we want. Come on, make that your prayer this morning. You're all- 
if you haven't a chance, there are stations around the back and on the sides with communion cups. first reaction was not of fear, but of joy and excitement. Um, that's not normally my first emotion. It's usually fear. That's, that's the first one all the time. But uh, I was really, really just full of joy, and I'm grateful for that. Um, because communion, for me, the Lord meets me in, meets me in such a special and personal way. Um, Jesus is the perfecter of what I usually refer to as like a holy tension. And in communion, that's something so beautiful and redemptive and healing out of something that was great suffering and pain and destruction. It's this tension of being able to skirt the line and experience the fullness of joy, not one that cheapens experiences and where we've been and what we've gone through, but the promise of the fullness of healing that only God can provide. So for joy today, I'm inviting you here to step into that space, to be joyous, to experience healing that only God can give us, and an encouragement to be bold and be vulnerable because joy can only be fully embraced with a level of vulnerability. Because to be joyous is to hope, and to be hopeful is inherently dangerous of waiting for the shoe to drop, something else that might go wrong. What happens when I don't want to dream? I'm scared to embrace. Who am I to embrace? I've had too much in my past. But that's a lie. I can speak personally to that as someone who grew up in a family riddled with adultery and addiction, someone who experienced their own journey with a poor relationship with different substances of self-harm for more than a decade, a suicide attempt, there is joy. There is joy for you. And it doesn't minimize what you've experienced but it speaks to the power and the capability and the full healing that God can give each one of us today. So I appreciate you being here. I appreciate you being brave to step into a space where you believe that you can move forward, that you're deserving of moving forward. You're worth it. And God calls us each by name. He wants us here. He wants us to be fully who we are, not minimizing the past, but embracing the joy of the future through his sacrifice and living in that holy tension. So I'll close this out with a prayer. And when you're ready, take communion on your own time. And thank you for letting me share a little bit about my own story. Father God, thank you so much for bringing us here today. Thank you for giving us all a community, God, where we can step out in boldness and know that we'll be caught by you and by the others here 
when things are hard, that we can step out in joy and excitement and purpose and boldness, knowing that we have you, Father, to make us strong and capable. Thank you for your sacrifice so we could be healed, so we can be your hands and feet. Thank you, God, just for the opportunity to be in your presence, to feel your spirit, to feel your goodness, your redemption, God. It is so good. the words we're about to sing. It messes me up. <laughs> it's so powerful though. Think about it. Your cross is my freedom. Your stripes are my healing. All praise to King Jesus. Your blood is still speaking. Your love is still reaching for us. And all we can do to respond, all praise. King Jesus. So I don't know about you, that gets me excited. That makes me grateful. That stirs my soul. So before we go into this time, just think about that. Think about that. How powerful that is. And if you're in a place you've already taken communion, if you want to stand, if you want to kneel, whatever you want to do, let's worship him. Let's sing this. Let's declare the blood of Jesus is still alive and moving. His love still reaches for you and me. Let's worship together. Come on. Your cross is my freedom. Your stripes are my healing. It's my freedom, your stripes, the 
that we get to have communion with you. We get to call you Lord and friend. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your love and your goodness. Thank you for your presence. We love you so much, Jesus. We love you, Lord. And everybody said, amen.